testing. Uh, my name is Herbert Rommel, Captain U.S. Navy, retired. I live at 77 Bridge Street, Newport, Rhode Island. Telephone is 401-847-7779. I was born October 27, 1915 at Philadelphia. I am making this tape at the request of Joe Todd, the oral historian. I'll start with the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor because that is probably what is of interest to most people. And then I'll run through your questionnaire and make comments about the other stuff. On December 7th, I was division officer of the 4th Division. Uh, that was the three-gun turret uh, at the stern of the ship. Uh, I was having breakfast on Sunday morning, and the reason I was up was because I was going out to the police pistol range for a pistol uh, match that day. Uh, I was in my high-collar whites. That was what we uh, uh, normally ate in and lived in, and even though it was Sunday morning, uh, we had to be dressed up. And as I was having breakfast, I heard explosions outside on Ford Island, which is the air station alongside where we were moored. I ran up onto deck and saw a Japanese tarp plane with the red balls coming directly at the ship and dropping a torpedo. And there was no doubt in my mind what was going on. So I ran aft to my uh, station air defense. Uh, turret crews would normally man their turrets, uh, not that they could shoot at anything, but I imagine for their own protection. Uh, in the meantime, the officer of the deck had sounded air defense on the bugle, which was the uh, a uh, proper thing to do. Uh, I had remembered a story about a bosun's mate who, uh, during a fire drill, uh, uh, they'd usually have a fire drill f uh, frequently in the incinerator. And uh, one day there was a real fire out of control in the incinerator, and he had passed the word, uh, a fire in the incinerator, this is no shit. And somehow that came to my mind, and as I ran aft, I grabbed the uh, 1MC uh, button and passed the word, this is a real air raid, this is no shit. And then I ran after my turret, and most of the men had manned the turret. Um, we heard uh, several explosions into the hull, and... Uh, it occurred to me that perhaps we should go out and assess the damage control properties, uh, 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 parties. And I started to climb out the uh, hatch at the after end of the turret, and just then there was another explosion nearby which sort of sent me scurrying back into the turret. In the meantime, uh, the ship started listing, and uh, became apparent we would have to uh, abandon ship. And by the time I got out of the uh, uh, overhang hatch, uh, the ship was so far listed over that I slipped right into the water. It was, you know, the deck was uh, at too much of an angle. So at that time, there was a uh, grating from the top of the uh, accommodation ladder floating. And I remember Red Templeton, who was the first class bosun's mate and the leading bosun's mate in the 4th Division, and I grabbed that uh, grate and sort of paddled with our feet and pushed on out into the bay. In the meantime, uh, all the uh, water was covered with oil, and of course we were all oil soaked. Uh, I shed my uh, trousers and shoes and uh, in the meantime, the Arizona blew up, and we saw that. And uh, finally, we were picked up by a 50-foot motor launch. And I remember the men had trouble getting us aboard the launch because we were so slippery. Uh, that launch took us to uh, uh, one of the landings, and uh, we all went ashore, and then the uh, 
coxswain of the launch ask if anyone would uh, uh, he needed a boat officer to go out and pick up more survivors so I said I would go out with him and we picked up another load of survivors and when we got back the uh, motor of the motor launch conked out so at that time the uh, gig of the Solus, the hospital ship, was in waiting for the captain, and that bosun, uh, that coxswain, wanted to do something. So I told him I'd be glad to come with him, and we went out. And uh, all morning, uh, we performed chores for the Solus. I remember we took some uh, men from the seaplane tender, which had been hit and was on fire, and these men were uh, loaded in their metal stretchers over onto this. Uh, old-fashioned captain's gig which of course had the rounded uh, canopy over the stern and was no kind of a, a boat to receive casualties but we did take these casualties to the Solus and uh, uh, in the meantime of course we saw the Nevada get underway and beach herself and it was just like a Sunday supplement with all the gun shooting and we didn't have too much uh, thought of time uh, when things quieted down about noon uh, back on the Solus they told me uh, they didn't need need us anymore didn't need me anymore and uh, in the meantime of course I had my uh, uh, oil soaked high collar whites and they gave me a pair of trousers and I went ashore to the submarine base where we spent that night and uh, they established an emergency fleet pooling office and I was ordered eventually to uh, after a few days to a to have a, a phone watch which was right in the uh, ante room to the uh, Admiral Kimmel's office the commander-in-chief of the fleet and this was a harbor entrance control watch where we had phones that we manned 24 hours a day and uh, well, it was it was obvious that uh, Admiral Kimmel w was a broken man. Uh, you know, I could hear him arguing with his staff about whether or not to bring in the carriers, which were about out of fuel and had to be brought in. And uh, it was a, a pretty sad situation. I remember one day I was ordered over to a, a mail sensor place where they had uh, sent a bunch of extra people to uh, try and move the backlog of mail. Initially, they censored uh, for the first few days all incoming and outgoing mail. And of course, reading people's private mail, which was never intended for censorship, uh, was quite an experience. Um, I, I was in that office for about, oh, four weeks when I got uh, know tired of the inactivity and I was able to get uh, ordered to a destroyer the Gridley where they thought they were getting a, a a very junior officer to help out with communications but when I was aboard went aboard uh, in early in January an OLAV came out and I made JG and so they were stuck with somebody who was a little more senior uh, so much for uh, December 7th and I'll now look at the um, uh, questionnaire and see what else there is. I had joined the Naval Reserve in 1934 with hopes of going to the Naval Academy, but I got my application in too late. And uh, so I was a seaman in the reserve making cruises on the East Coast on the four stackers and on the old Texas uh, for four years. And then I took correspondence courses, and I was going to night school at Penn, and I applied for a commission as an ensign and was very pleased uh, to get it in 1938. So I continued in the reserve, and as soon as uh, it was possible, I volunteered for active duty. At that time, the call went out for reserves for six months or less should the emergency be less. And the orders stated that the commanding officer could send you home at any time if he didn't like your performance. Well, I applied for these orders in as early as I could, 
and got them as I think in January of, of 1940. And uh, my orders were to report to the Oklahoma at San Pedro on uh, March 4th. So I didn't know where San Pedro was too well. And I, I took a train out to the west coast. And of course, uh, the train or bus that I t finally got on stopped at Long Beach. And I didn't know that Long Beach was part of the same place, the harbor of, of San Pedro. So I took a bus over to San Pedro. I was very lucky to catch the last stores boat. They used to send a motor launch in once a day to pick up stores. And I didn't know that all the uh, main boat schedule, the motor launches and motor boats uh, going out to the ship came into Long Beach. So I got out to the ship and it was on a weekend. Practically nobody on board but the duty section. And uh, it was quite an experience. I was a junior officer ordered to the 4th Division and our division officer was Lieutenant Junior Grade Simono. Uh, Lieutenant Simono had married a Norwegian girl and uh, uh, a beautiful girl. He'd met her on a midshipman's cruise and he was a wonderful division officer. The 4th uh, Division uh, had an E and three hash marks on the turret. And they were very proud. You used to get your hash marks in the E at the short range battle practice. And uh, the turret was uh, quite an impressive piece of machinery. Uh, people that have seen it in pictures uh, might recognize that the guns come down before they shoot again and, and they're elevated. They had to come down to the loading platform for the uh, shell to be rammed in and then four bags of powder to be pushed in and then the breech closed. And then the guns would be elevated to the proper elevation. And uh, all this had to be done uh, with great rapidity for the short range battle practice because time as well as uh, uh, hitting the target counted. Well, unfortunately, although for me, I think it was fortunate, uh, we did lose the E that year because the next year, uh, I was the one who fired the short range battle practice and I would hate to have been the one to wipe the E off the turret. Um, Forrest Simono was lost on the Argonaut. He went to sub school uh, before the war started and I was ordered to uh, command the turret. At that time there were only uh, a few reserves on board to begin with. Uh, one had come from the merchant marines and I had come from the reserve and another one had come from the reserve. Uh, none of the V-11 and special program people had gotten there yet. Uh, the inspections in those days uh, were held in full dress with the epaulets and fore and aft hats. And they uh, did not require the reserves who reported aboard uh, to purchase uh, the full dress, and I never did. Um, the emphasis on peacetime routine and uh, doing things the way they always have been done uh, was one of the causes of the tragedy at Pearl. For instance, on the Oklahoma, uh, we were scheduled to uh, have a material inspection on Monday, on Monday the 8th. And in preparation for that, all the blister covers had been removed. Uh, the blisters were large, uh, empty compartments that had been added to the hull to uh, give uh, protection from uh, a torpedo attack. And uh, they, they sort of extended out horizontally from the side of the ship for about, oh, maybe three feet, and then tapered on down to the keel. And the manhole covers on this blister, the horizontal part, had been removed to air them out in preparation for the inspection on Monday. And that is the reason the Oklahoma rolled over instead of sunk. 
because as soon as she took uh, the hits on the port side and uh, started to list, as soon as those blisters got under water, uh, the water just poured in and there's no way that uh, the damage control station, if it was manned, and it probably was, uh, could have counterbalanced the ship and counter flooded to have kept her on an even keel. She just went right over, I would say in about 10 minutes. And uh, looking back from in the water, uh, it was uh, just like a sailboat going over. Slow, inexorable, nothing you could do about it. Uh, nothing swift or rushing, it just slowly went over. Now, um, another item about Pearl Harbor, which shows the uh, uh, unreadiness of the fleet, and of course I consider this to be a command responsibility and Admiral Kimmel's responsibility, was uh, at 6.30 in the morning, as you know, the Iron War to destroyer fired at what they thought was a submarine, and it turned out it was a submarine, and they reported in plain language at 6.30 to the fleet headquarters that they had done this. And her, here we were, sitting on the uh, Oklahoma, about five miles away, and an hour and a half later, we didn't even know about this attack. And five or ten minutes warning would have made all the difference in the world, because uh, the ships would have been buttoned up, the men would have been at general quarters, the guns would have been manned and ready. Uh, the Oklahoma never fired a shot in anger in two wars. Uh, we had uh, anti-aircraft guns, the five-inch guns that had been added, uh, with uh, two, two guns had ready crews and had uh, ammunition in the ready locker. But the old peacetime precautions, the ready lockers were locked, and the officer of the deck had the key. And uh, uh, the officer of the deck was supposed to keep the key around his neck. Well, of course, for convenience, the key was hung in the officer of the deck shack where it would be readily available. But the senior watch officer, who was uh, Lieutenant Roberts, he, we used to call him old Um Yum Roberts, uh, he found out about this one day and raised the devil and told the officer of the deck he'd have to keep the key around his neck. And you guessed it, whoever had the mid-watch had, still had the key. So the officer on the four to eight, the officer of the deck, had no key to the ready locker, and uh, uh, the, the five-inch guns never were fired. Uh, the Marines may have gotten up into the uh, tops and fired machine guns. I'm not sure. Uh, another example of the uh, unreadiness uh, was what they had their minds on. Uh, for instance, on December 8th, and I wish I'd have kept it, an unclassified order came out, fleet order, uh, signed by the chief of staff. And of course, as you understand, these things are prepared well in advance and are eventually processed through the staff and are signed out at an appropriate level. And this thing from the commander in chief, signed by the chief of staff, was an order that henceforth all officers would wear hats when they went ashore on liberty. And there'd been so much agitation about being a gentleman and wearing hats on liberty that the hats were called Kimmels by the officers. Uh, in all fairness, when the fleet had been out for exercises the previous week or two, uh, we had uh, been going around with darkened ship and, you know, with uh, un more than usual precautions at sea. But the newspapers those days, at the, towards the end of November, uh, we're saying, the Honolulu Advertiser was saying such things as war is no longer a meaningless phrase. And uh, there, there were plenty of indications that, uh, uh, you know, things were going to happen. And of course, in retrospect, uh, we should have had the warning. And as I've said, a uh, five minutes warning would have ma made for the whole fleet all the difference in the world. Uh, you all know the stories of the radar station where the uh, soldiers uh, got word of stuff coming in. Uh, I do not think that the president was part of a conspiracy. Uh, I think that uh, part of it was due to inter-service uh, rivalry, the uh, confusion over sending out the war warning message, the final war warning message from uh, 
Washington, which did not arrive until after the attack began because of inter-service rivalry between the Army and Navy over whose circuit it would be sent on. Uh, when I first reported aboard, my quarters were in the uh, junior officer's mess. And the junior officer's mess was uh, a pretty informal place. And then after a while, as more junior officers came aboard and I was a little more senior, uh, when I got to be a division officer, I was moved up to the wardroom mess. And uh, I had a, uh, a nice room, which uh, no one else was assigned to at the time, as I remember. And I, I got back to that room after the ship had been raised. Uh, I had no trouble getting back aboard, and nobody accompanied me back to my room. And uh, I went in there, and somebody, of course, you know, the civilian divers blamed the Navy, and the Navy blamed the civilian divers. Uh, somebody had stolen uh, a gold watch from from my desk that uh, uh, I'd had there, and the place had been looted that way. Uh, some of the papers that had been months and months in the water were, were pressed together tight in the desk and, you know, were still readable. And I suppose I should have saved some of them, but somehow, uh, well, all the drawers to the cabinets were stuck shut, and, and I just didn't want any part of anything that was there, and I didn't take any uh, souvenirs from my room. Uh, I don't remember exactly what month or year this was, but it was after the ship had been righted, and of course before she sailed on her last voyage. Uh, I should mention uh, something about our captains. Uh, when I reported aboard, uh, the skipper was E.J. Foy and he was uh, a wonderful man. He had been skipper when the ship had been in a, I guess you'd call it a, a collision or two. Uh, one of them was when we were on uh, some maneuvers darkened ship on the west coast. Uh, this would have been about uh, either late in 40 or early in 41 and uh, Back on the turret, I don't know what uh, 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 what what had happened, but it was you know dark, darkened ship, and there'd been some maneuver where apparently the Enterprise and the Oklahoma were about to collide, and uh, we heard the word passed over the loudspeaker, "Stand by for a collision forward," and "Stand by for a collision midships." Uh, I had a on the turret, we had a. Uh, a talker, a uh, sound-powered phone talker stationed on top of the turret, uh, mainly so that uh, the guns would not tangle with the guns of turret three if we were training at different elevations and in different directions. And uh, this uh, talker was speechless for several minutes because apparently the large overhang of the Enterprise did pass right over our turret and actually bent at right angles the stern flagpole. So there was technically a collision, and it was that close. Uh, but uh, the collision that um, did in our skipper was with, I believe, the Arizona, and had just happened uh, about two or three months or a month before Pearl Harbor. And it, uh, once again, was during uh, night maneuvers uh, off the west coast, as I remember it, and uh, the Arizona uh, bashed into uh, to us, as I uh, as I recall, and we had to um, go to the shipyard and get it fixed up. The, there was an inquiry, and all the papers were aboard uh, one of the battleships, which was uh, uh, burned up. So there never was a court-martial, but of course our skipper was relieved. He eventually was rehabilitated and became the, Admiral Foy became the first commandant of the Armed Forces Staff College or one of, the, or one of those uh, schools. But what I remember was we had a new skipper. I forget his name, but he later went on to be a skipper of uh, one of the cruisers, the one that was said to have run away at uh, Guadalcanal 
the, uh, uh, and uh, he later shot himself. Uh, but he uh, came back to the ship and took one look and walked away, and that was the last we saw of him. But Admiral Foy, who was really our captain, uh, talked to us. This was after the attack, and what could he do for us? Well, what he could do for me, well, first of all, he, he gave me $10, because we had no money, we had no nothing. Uh, the uh, emergency pay things hadn't been opened, you know, and we, and we needed a uh, little change. And he, he said, what could he do for me? And I said, well, could you get word to my mother, I was not married at the time, uh, that I'm okay? And he said, all right, I'll, I'll send her a telegram. He said, but I'll have to take the money back because I just don't have that much. So he'd been giving money to everybody in the crew. So he did that for me, and, and uh, that was the first my mother was able to learn that, that I was okay. So he was a, a wonderful captain, much loved by the crew, and uh, I was very glad that he later did make Admiral and uh, had a successful career, but unfortunately not a combat career. Uh, now let's get down to some real trivia. Uh, in the wardroom mess, uh, they had a cigar mess, and uh, we kept a little uh, uh, supply of uh, soft drinks and cigars and cigarettes and candy. And after the uh, uh, meal, uh, there'd usually be a few officers who would uh, sit around in the wardroom for a while, and they would roll dice for uh, uh, for who was going to pay for the candy and, and whatever it was. And uh, there were five dice, and I don't recall just how how it all went anymore, but I know that if you rolled five aces in one roll, you had to uh, buy candy for everybody in the wardroom, and they had what they called a Five Aces Club. And uh, this was a brass plaque on which they would put wax, and you would sign your name, and then they would etch in with acid your signature when, when you won or lost, as the, <laughs> whichever you would consider it. And I remember I had, in the uh, two years I was aboard, year and a half, uh, had made the Five Aces Club just once. And I often wonder what happened to that plaque and who got it. It probably got into some souvenir shop and is kicking around in the country someplace. Uh, so much for the Five Aces Club. Uh, one of the interesting things, which probably is not a part of any history yet, is the scandal about the ship's service. Uh, we had a Commander Supply Corps Levisseur and a passed over Lieutenant Miller uh, Miller was the ship service officer, and Levisseur was the uh, uh, supply officer. And between them, they had embezzled uh, thousands of dollars from the uh, uh, ship service uh, fund. And uh, they were able to do it because the uh, uh, bank statements came, uh, showing a smaller balance would come in. But since the supply officer uh, was auditing the thing, uh, between them, they could cover up the shortages. Uh, they were dis uh, discovered and uh, transferred before the attack, and I was told that uh, Lieutenant Miller eventually got back into some civilian job with the Navy, and uh, I don't know whatever happened to Levisseur, and I don't even know whether the trial or whatever they were going to have was uh, delayed or canceled or the evidence burned up as a result of Pearl Harbor, but uh, that was one of the uh, bad things about the Oklahoma. And I suppose another bad thing would be the uh, uh, oh, the chief bosun mates, the leading bosun mates, control of uh, gambling on the ship. Uh, it was all pretty organized. I didn't know much about it. What I knew was only from rumor. Uh, I never had any direct contact with it, 
but that would be an interesting story to uh, to investigate uh, just just how uh, much of a mafia there was on the uh, on the gambling. Uh, sports were a big deal in the fleet in those days. Uh, the only one that I got personally involved with was uh, sailboat sailing. Uh, we had a sailing whale boat. Uh, we had uh, a couple of them, as a matter of fact, and there were none of the officers interested in sailing, and I was able to take the boat out a few times, and I finally got some Marines interested in sailing, and uh, they had become fairly proficient. And one day, uh, out in Pearl Harbor, and the Marines boat uh, turned over, and it turned over 180 degrees, turned turtle. And of course, some of these Marines couldn't even swim, and of course, slowly they started climbing up on the keel of the boat. And uh, I thought I could count the proper number of heads, and it turned out that uh, they all did survive, although it was a real scare for me. It was on a weekend, and they towed the boat back to the ship and uh, hoisted it and righted it and got everything squared away. And uh, the officer of the deck, I guess, noted it in his log. But I remember the chief bosun, whose name was Bothney, was real mad at me for not reporting it to him. And of course, uh, since there were no casualties, uh, I didn't consider it uh, noteworthy enough to uh, to report to him. And of course, it was not something that, that I was proud of because I, I felt responsible for the training to those Marines. I was just so happy that uh, there were no casualties because there well could have been. Uh, in these days of radar and uh, all the aids to navigation they have, it's, it's hard to uh, remember just how hazardous uh, going to sea was in those days. Uh, a little incident, we were going to the shipyard in Bremerton for an overhaul, and as we were uh, going, <coughs> going up the uh, entrance to, the, to Bremerton, it was quite foggy. We were going very slowly, and out of the fog uh, came uh, a tug and a barge, and the tug was able to turn away, uh, but of course the barge, had they had no control over it, and it uh, slowly came, and we backed down, there was nothing we could do, and it was a barge loaded with uh, railroad cars, and that barge hit us on the port side and lurched and all the railroad cars fell into the river just like little toy trains. Uh, fortunately, since it happened on the port side and under the circumstances, uh, the skipper was not at fault, but uh, a collision will never do him any good. Uh, there are two real minor items of discipline which nevertheless stick in my mind. Uh, I was able to uh, be a senior watch officer fairly early, and uh, not a senior watch officer, but a, a, a watch officer qualified both underway and, and uh, in port. And one day in port up in uh, the Bremerton Navy Yard, uh, as usual, the people who got the ferry were all about five minutes late. As I remember it, Liberty expired at quarter of eight. And uh, uh, this, uh, the ferry got in at such a time that unless somebody really ran from the ferry landing, uh, they'd stroll aboard a few minutes late. And I had been to Commander Kenworthy, the executive officer, to suggest that uh, couldn't he make liberty a little later so these men wouldn't be late. And his attitude was, well, they should have gotten an earlier ferry or uh, you know, Liberty was up when it was up. So being a little stupid and uh, brash, uh, one day I, uh, exactly at the, when I had the deck, exactly at quarter of eight, I lined up everybody who came aboard and took their name, and there were about 75 of them, and I sent them down to the executive officer. I don't know, think anything ever, still ever came of it, 
But unfortunately, among those 75 people was the uh, uh, leading chief uh, master at arms of the ship. And of course, I was not too popular with him after that. And I can remember one day he put one of my men on report and actually took him up to the captain for having his undershirt out, sticking out, you know, with bare skin when he was uh, uh, holy stone in the deck. So uh, that was the kind of viciousness uh, you could run into. And the other one that bothered me very much, uh, I had a third class petty officer who uh, had been on the ship for about four years. And he had, had not had a too good record originally, but he was now married and was settled down. And he was the coxswain of a 50-foot motor launch. Well, one day, I guess he ran too close to a buoy going into uh, uh, Long Beach and bent the propeller on his ship. Well, this was no big deal. We had a, uh, all kinds of shop people, and they were able to haul the boat out and get the propeller fixed very quickly. But they took him up to the captain, and uh, the captain busted him. In those days, the captain could uh, take their rate away only if they had made the rate aboard that ship, which he had. If they had been made their rate and then transferred to another ship, they couldn't lose their rate without a court-martial. And, of course, I testified for the guy. Uh, the attitude of uh, the powers that be was that... Uh, he obviously went inside the buoy or he wouldn't have uh, uh, bent the propeller. And they made no allowance for the fact that uh, at low tide that perhaps the buoy was in such a position that you could damage your propeller even though you were uh, uh, steering the boat properly. And uh, as I say, that sticks in my mind. Uh, one of my interesting jobs when I got to be turret officer was firing off the uh, uh, scouting plane. Uh, we had catapults on top of the th uh, turret 3 and turret 4, and uh, uh, you had a little 4-inch uh, gun on the turret. It was a gun-fired catapult, uh, that is, a gun on the catapult to shoot the plane off. And the pilot would get in the plane and would rev up his engines and give the signal that he was ready, and he'd lean his head back because it was quite a shock. And then you were supposed to fire him on an uproll so that he'd be thrown up into the air instead of on a down roll where he'd be thrown down into the sea. And uh, it, it always used to give me, um, oh, I won't say I was scared, but I was concerned every time I fired him off. And uh, uh, we used to recover them. Uh, the ship would make a, a slow turn and uh, maybe a 135 degrees and make a slick. And he would come in and uh, land on the water and sail up into the slick and catch a hook into a net that we towed and then would be hoisted aboard. Uh, one of the pilots, when we were out at Pearl, uh, gave me a ride in uh, this little biplane. We started out with biplanes, uh, SOCs, and then by the time of Pearl Harbor, we had the single engine scouting planes, OS2Us. Well, he gave me a, a ride in this biplane, and uh, of course, I had never been up before, and he wanted to show me what it could do, and and I didn't too much appreciate the rolls and the dive bombing because those planes were never really built to do that. And I never did get uh, interested in aviation. Uh, a brief word about the USS Oklahoma Association. It was formed by uh, survivors from World War I. And one time, it was in about 1959 or 60, when I was in New York with the foreign officers from the War College, uh, I ran into a, a group, I think they were having a reunion at the same hotel we were staying, and uh, uh, they invited me to their meeting and let me join. At that time, it was all old-timers, and I was probably one of the first of the uh, people from Pearl Harbor and in between uh, to be allowed to join. Uh, they have reunions every year. I was treasurer. Uh, for of the organization for a while, and uh, we always had a uh, a fine time, uh, which uh, 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 you, Mr. Todd, will enjoy this year. I understand. Well, I guess that's enough. Uh,
trivia about the ship. The Oklahoma was a happy ship. They still spoke about a skipper, uh, Happy Hardigan, who had been uh, before Admiral Foy and who must have been a real character and was also very much loved by the crew. Uh, I enjoyed my duty on the Oklahoma. I, I think I learned a lot. Uh, after I left the uh, job at the headquarters, fleet headquarters, I went to a destroyer, the Gridley, and was there for three years under six different skippers and worked my way up to exec. And then I was ordered to command the Wilkes for the last year of the war. And of course, that's the, uh, the ultimate for any naval officer to command his own ship in wartime. And then uh, after the war was over, I applied for the regular Navy. I had always wanted to get in and was fortunate to get in. And I've had a happy and reasonably successful career. I uh, went to the Line School and the War College and taught at the Line School and War College and uh, I was on the staff of Sinkland Fleet and the Strategic Plans Division, OPNAV, and uh, had command of uh, another destroyer, the Hainsworth, and then uh, the Amphion and the Hyades, and finally ended up as Chief of Staff to Naval Base Newport. And I retired here in Newport, where I'm happy that I have survived this long to be able to collect that check every month. So for anybody who's gotten this far listening to all this garbage, uh, it's a pleasure being with you. This is Herb Rommel. So long.